Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Rebecca Hurst, and I'm the director of the Sustainable Solutions Lab at UMass Boston. The Sustainable Solutions Lab, or SISL as we like to call it, is a research and action institute on campus. And we're focused on um, keeping historically excluded people and communities safe and healthy in the face of our changing climate. I'm so glad you've all joined us today for the release of Climate and Housing Crisis, a research agenda for urban communities. This is a Lincoln Institute of Land Policy working paper that was developed in partnership with CISL. I'd like to start off today with a land acknowledgement. While I know people are zooming in from all over, I am currently on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people who are the traditional stewards of this place and are still here with us today. And I'd also like to acknowledge their near neighbors, the Nipmuc and Wapanoag peoples. So with that, I will hand it over to Amy Cotter, our key partner with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, and we will get started. Thanks again, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'm Amy Cotter, Director of Climate Strategies for the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, um, which has as its mission to improve the quality of life and quality of place through the effective use, taxation, and stewardship of land. Uh, we do that in service of six goals that include fostering low carbon climate resilient places, equitable tax systems, and reducing spatial inequality. Um, holding all of those goals simultaneously means we need to look for synergies in solution spaces. And, um, and I'm particularly delighted to have had the opportunity to work on this project with Rebecca, Michael, and the team. Um, because I think we're starting to identify some really promising avenues for further research that would allow us to um, hopefully make progress on climate goals through housing work or vice versa. Um, so with no further ado, I will pass it on to Michael for the rest of our program. Yes, thank you very much, Amy. Um, uh, I'm Michael Johnson, I'm professor and chair of the Department of Public Policy um, and Public Affairs. Um, my research training is in an applied engineering field called operations research, and I'm interested in helping individuals and organizations make um, better decisions. Um, it's been a pleasure to um, uh, work with Lincoln Institute uh, of Land Policy. I'm really grateful um, for um, the encouragement and support I've gotten. Um, and it's also been great to get the support uh, for the project from the beginning from the Sustainable Solutions Lab, especially uh, support for doctoral student researchers. I'd like to introduce the members of our project team who co-authored the working paper. And as I do so, I'd like to encourage each of you um, in the larger participant audience to introduce yourself to all of us in the chat. And if you'd like to rename your Zoom name to add your professional affiliation. Patricio Beloy, you can raise your hand, is a doctoral candidate in the public policy PhD program here at UMass Boston. His research explores how environmental energy and climate policies can concurrently promote needs-based community development through meaningful engagement and knowledge co-production. Heather McLean, you could raise your hand, is a graduate of the Urban Planning and Community Development Master's Program at UMass Boston. Her professional interests are developing strategies to um, develop neighborhoods without displacement and improve food access for all residents. Sajani Kandel is a doctoral candidate in the Environmental Sciences PhD program at UMass Boston. Her research involves using a transdisciplinary approach to understand wicked problems in environmental stewardship and climate resiliency planning to create equitable and more just planning practices. Um, thank you, Patricio, Heather, and Sajani for all you've done. I'd like now to uh, transition to um, a brief presentation of the working paper itself. Um, that will be followed by um, um, brief remarks and discussion. Um, and after that, um, breakout rooms where we can discuss um, uh, four questions, ones that you've seen in um, the registration materials um, that hopefully can expand upon themes from the, uh, the uh, working paper. So I will uh, share my screen. So um, as I've said, uh, it's uh, myself, Patricio, Lois, Sajani, Kendall, and Heather um, McLean 
um, who have who are proud to present this working paper to you. Patricio will discuss um, a part of the working paper farther into the presentation. Uh, we're going to describe a project supported by Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and Sustainable Solutions Lab um, to explore the impacts of the housing affordability crisis and the climate crisis amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic and policy and planning responses to this crisis. We started this work by recognizing uh, no single body of research or municipal plans that respond to both of these crises together. And we wanted to develop a research initiative that uh, emphasized equity, a critical approach and racial and social justice. And the focus of this presentation is to present findings from community engaged uh, problem structuring activities um, that culminate in research questions that we hope will uh, set uh, the foundation for um, a really robust uh, uh, multi um, uh, 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 disciplinary um, and cross sector inquiry for um, some time to come. All of us remember, I think, the extreme weather event of late summer that spread rain and high winds throughout a wide swath of the south, and southwest, and northeast in the space of just a few days. Ida caused over $50 billion in damages and an estimated 96 direct and indirect deaths. The majority of deaths and damage from this event, first a hurricane, then a tropical depression occurred in the Northeast where Ida was the third tropical storm in three weeks. The damage occurred primarily via flash floods in urbanized areas uh, damage in the Northeast occurred primarily by flash floods in urbanized areas and tornado outbreaks. And for me, it was, uh, and for many of us, it was very surprising to see how quickly our transportation systems were overwhelmed. Most shocking were reports of people drowning in their homes as the waters rushed in. Imagine the horror felt by those in basement apartments in New York City and those in New Orleans who died from heat exposure after the electricity grid failed. Most news accounts didn't mention a connection to climate change, but Al Roper's remarks were a prominent exception. Ida may have brought home for many of us the interconnectedness of the housing and climate crises. Storm damage and deaths may have been easier to accept in places traditionally seen as vulnerable to hurricanes, but seemed uh, devastating much closer to home. The connections between housing and affordability, climate change impacts and COVID-19 for low and moderate income communities and communities of color we visualized in a dramatic way. Climate change represented by extreme weather events can result in health impacts such, such as psychological distress and allergies and asthma exacerbated by climate change, as well as lack of public spaces to cool down during heat events. Those impacts can increase vulnerability to COVID-19 infection. In turn, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in extreme health impacts as well as job loss. This financial insecurity amplifies a variety of financial cost burdens, such as using air conditioning for heat relief and introduces housing insecurity, which amplifies the effects of the ongoing housing crisis. Moreover, housing market changes can increase the risk of displacement, adaptation and mitigation efforts by property owners, as well as gentrification related activities can generally increase housing expenses and increase housing insecurity. This research project brings together knowledge from multiple disciplines, public policy, urban planning, environmental science, and decision and data science. Our work is fundamentally a transdisciplinary effort, and I'll turn it over to Patricio to describe this. Hey, uh, hello everyone. My name is Patricio, as Michael already introduced me. And I just want to show something that, yeah, probably some people say, okay, now the academia people starting with their very, you know, schemes and so on. <laughs> I'm sorry if, if this is, uh, looks a bit confusing, but the challenge we had um, during the project, right, was to harmonize, um, you know, and we noticed this during the discussions, um, some empirical knowledge that we saw, uh, um, some, uh, you know, even informal non-expert knowledge with expert knowledge. And also we had the issue that some people said after the convenings we had that, um, you know, some of the participants were at the very high level, right? We were talking about um, a new way of looking at uh, a new paradigm, right? Uh, ways to, you know, um, put, uh, put a, 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 I don't know, social, social justice at the center, while others were more focused on 
pragmatic solutions, right? Developing new technologies and so on. So how can we see this as a, as a system? We, we started asking ourselves. Um, although I, I knew this uh, framework from, from before, it was Sajani Kandel from our team who came, who connected all of this. This is a model, it's called the transdisciplinary pyramid from Max Neff and based on the work of other researchers in which we basically um, try to see what are disciplines that are at the empirical level in the work we are doing, right? How do we know what we know? Um, and what are disciplines that using that empirical uh, information, right, uh, are at the pragmatic level? So how do we do things? What, what are the things we can do? We identified all of that right in the, in a, in the data collection we, we made. But there's then another level called the normative level in which we also try to organize all of that pragmatism, you know, how, how we do things. And then the conversation also flowed at the value level, meaning the ethics, the philosophy. So we try to highlight, right, how this value level being present, being well-defined can be mainstream into the policy level. And then also the way we do things, the way we approach these problems in the pragmatic, right, and also in the empirical, right, what are the methods we, we use to understand this problem also can also be related to this value level. We are not only doing things because we can, and we are not only doing things because being green is good. No, we want to change, right, certain uh, features of the system. This, uh, this um, model is also, in, in this case, uh, thanks, thanks to Gassiluso and Boyle, um, adapted this model to, the, to another system of three knowledges in which there is a system knowledge, right, of we, which tries to understand the phenomena. And there is a target knowledge up there, especially defined by the upper levels of this pyramid that envisions a new system status. We have a good, an example, the Northland Newton development, for example, a project that we think achieved, right, some a uh, mix of being uh, climate uh, in, in, uh, in line with climate preparedness, but also tries to be affordable. So it tries to address the issue, right, of, of climate and housing. But that's only one example that, that happened, right, in a, in a very uh, specific situation under very specific conditions. How do we take that, right, to the policy level? How do we take an experience in which advocates can talk at the same level with experts and telling them, right, that other technologies exist. How do we actually get there? It is through tra transformative knowledge or how or, or trying to change the system as a whole. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. The data for our project came from three sources. The first was interviews with scholars, housing developers, advocates, and funders between December 2019 and January 2021 to learn about specific initiatives to address the housing and climate crises. The second source uh, was a community town hall that took place in J July 2020 to learn the stories of community residents in Boston who are facing the housing and climate crises in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The third data source is a convening of academics, practitioners, funders, and advocates in August 2020 to learn how we frame and ask questions about the housing and climate crises, to learn how climate-focused policy instruments can address housing needs and ways to align priorities of housing and climate advocates to put vulnerable communities at the center of politics and policy. Our interviews, town hall, and convening generated a wide range of insights about how stakeholders experience the housing and climate crises and generated a number of research and practice opportunities. So among these findings I'd like to emphasize are the distress felt by low and moderate income communities and communities of color in the face of these crises, the innovation embodied by a few distinctive climate ready projects and the question of whether these innovations can be adapted, the technical administrative and financial challenges of responding to these crises, the importance of community engagement at all stages of the problem solution process, and the opportunities to amplify our impact by putting the needs of traditionally marginalized communities at the center of our work. Our analysis, uh, in the service of developing a research agenda yielded three broad research questions. And uh, each of these have different um, academic connections uh, and different practitioner connections as well. And they reflect a variety of themes that came up through our research. The first one uh, is what uh, community characteristics can support successful implementation of residential development projects 
that are affordable and sustainable? And the motivation for this question was our realization there might be substantial barriers to replicating or adapting successful efforts in affluent, more affluent politically influential communities uh, to meet the needs of less affluent and politically influential communities. This question I think is most central to our problem structure and project. It reflects themes that occurred across all of our data gathering activities and reflects the potential for robust academic findings. The second research question arose from our awareness of managerial, technical, and financial challenges associated with development of affordable and sustainable housing. We were struck by the idea that certain projects that might not be feasible according to the balance sheet reflect beneficial long-term and non-monetary impacts that could accrue to residents and communities. There might be an opportunity to adapt principles of social cost-benefit analysis to assist developers, advocates, and government managers to develop a social policy rationale, projects that are innovative based on affordability and sustainability, especially in vulnerable communities. And we think these concerns can have tangible impacts for practitioners, advocates, and public servants. The last research question arises from our realization that the problems that developers, planners, and community developers solve daily are technically pretty demanding. They need to navigate policies, procedures, and regulations to determine how a certain project might be designed, cited, financed, and constructed. Developers understand that different types of developments of different sizes and technologies might be more appropriate for some communities and locations than others. So there may be an opportunity to adapt some principles of the decision sciences to enable stakeholders to jointly identify, design, and solve problems associated with urban affordability and affordable and sustainable housing. So our work on the housing and climate crisis project so far has identified a range of applied and community engaged transdisciplinary research opportunities, and we've listed them here. We think this research agenda can generate practitioner focused knowledge that directly benefits communities, can draw from and enrich multiple disciplinary traditions, and can enhance education and community partnerships. And the purpose of this event today is uh, for us to explore uh, some of the um, opportunities that might uh, that, that you might connect with um, our, our preliminary work on um, this area. Uh, I want to thank again uh, Rebecca Hurst um, and the Sustainable Solutions Lab and Amy Cotter and the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, whose uh, funding, support, and enthusiasm and patience have really made this project possible. The working paper has uh, many really good resources uh, that may be of interest to you, and I've listed just a few of them here. So I'd like to uh, la uh, last uh, thank you for your attention and uh, transition to, uh, in a few minutes, uh, these breakout rooms. But first, um, and, and I've listed the questions for the breakout rooms here, um, but I want to open it up to any questions or comments or reflections on the presentation and the working paper um, as we uh, set up our, our breakout session. So um, the floor is now uh, yours, all who um, have, uh, are in, in attendance. Thank you very much. So for questions, um, you're welcome to put them in the chat and um, Melanie can uh, share them with me. Or if it's uh, more convenient for you, you can uh, simply raise your hand. Okay, well, I'd like to um, emphasize um, uh, one uh, uh, theme that I thought uh, really sort of drove this. And this was um, this uh, uh, evolving understanding that um, many sort of innovative practices uh, that we saw in climate ready uh, housing in Newton, Massachusetts and in Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, seem to embody uh, wonderful principles of uh, community engagement, uh, cutting edge technology, et cetera. Uh, but we, we didn't see um, a, a clear path to adapting uh, these knowledges to uh, the needs of um, uh, le less uh, well-resourced um, communities um, in the uh, city of Boston or in other similar cities. And uh, we were struck that we didn't see as, many, um, uh, as much evidence of this cutting edge work in a number of development projects that are going on in Boston now. This is, so this is something that inspired us. And since we have um, 
participants from outside of Boston, maybe this resonates with what you've seen in your own communities. Another thing that, um, that, that I think uh, 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 inspired us was that uh, uh, housing development is a numbers game. Uh, the numbers have to work for the project to go forward. And as somebody who teaches uh, cost benefit analysis to uh, policy students, uh, we were struck by the notion that uh, there may be uh, social benefits uh, to um, uh, uh, housing developments that are climate ready that uh, may be hard to capture using uh, conventional accounting schemes and that some additional expertise could uh, develop arguments for um, uh, dollar value benefits that could be persuasive to um, cities, states, and other funders who are, are seeking rationales for um, the money that they provide. And maybe this resonates with uh, some of your own experiences. Okay, so I see one question. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Michael, it's Matthew Kiefer raising his hand. Yes, yes thank Matthew. you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for recognizing me and thanks for that presentation. You know, Michael, you just touched on an issue that I'm very curious about um, on cost benefit analysis as a tool and especially, you know, where the costs are dollar costs and the benefits are social benefits. You know, you have this kind of apples and oranges problem of how do you quantify those social benefits how do you turn them into dollar value so you can compare them against dollars? Or is that even a useful exercise? Does that sort of compromise the, the way social benefits are perceived to turn them into dollar figures? Uh, there, may be, uh, other, there may be other economists in the audience. I'm not an economist, but uh, the way I understand uh, cost benefit analysis is that there are a number of ways to estimate uh, uh, the uh, dollar value equivalents to certain kinds of impacts or to elicit from stakeholders their assessments of the value that certain kinds of interventions uh, can provide to them or to their communities. So for example, um, in transportation projects, there are certain kinds of shadow prices or well understood dollar equivalents um, for certain kinds of um, interventions, dollars per uh, hour of additional uh, product, productivity time or leisure savings. So there are ways that you can put dollars on uh, increased um, uh, perceived quality of life, uh, increased uh, satisfaction with the community, uh, decreased uh, fear of uh, vulnerability to climate events, et cetera. And um, these are certainly dollar impacts that uh, we can balance against the out-of-pocket costs of building new infrastructure. Thank you. Um, let me see in the chat if there are any questions. Can you comment on how zoning impacts the interactions between housing development and climate impacts? Uh, the analysis I see of this often seem very simplistic um, and I expect the issues are quite a bit more um, complex. Uh, I can't uh, I can't comment on this directly. Um, zoning is, is not um, my expertise. Um, but I think that we could think of it this way, that there are ways to uh, develop econometric models that um, can uh, relate uh, changes in uh, physical infrastructure, uh, changes in social infrastructure, and changes in rules like zoning to uh, changes in um, measures like um, property values or changes in other dependent variables like uh, vulnerable, uh, 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 undesirable outcomes of extreme weather events. And there are ways then of assessing the uh, relative impact, all of the things being held equal of certain kinds of changes in zoning as compared to uh, changes in housing development uh, standards or changes in climate impacts. Does that answer your question, Tom? Okay. Uh, Just regarding, sorry, Michael, the, the previous question on, how, on whether this research incorporates climate mitigation. Um, I think we, yeah, we, that, that's, that's a challenge. That's something that we discussed a lot, right? While seeing what are these interventions actually doing? 
Um, is, is this actually climate adaptation mitigation? That's a very odd discussion. Uh, most of the interventions today try to, you know, uh, address both um, in, in some way, but uh, there's always a trade-off. Uh, the answer, so the answer is, I guess, no, we, we did not. And of course, this question is important. I think uh, we're, we're gonna keep it because uh, we should. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, and so I would say that um, our, our, our first motivation was um, uh, adaptation, uh, understanding in the short term, how um, neighborhoods, communities, and cities um, are acting to re react to sort of immediate um, type events. Um, but we understand that uh, for different uh, kinds of communities, uh, mitigation uh, may uh, take a higher, a higher profile. At this point, um, I would like to transition now to um, our um, breakout rooms. And what I'm gonna do is uh, share um, my screen again, and then I'll, I'll close it down. But we have identified four questions that we thought um, could support uh, some uh, interesting conversation amongst all of us. And uh, we have uh, set up um, uh, four, uh, uh, actually eight breakout rooms uh, two for each of these questions, and we've allowed uh, each of you to uh, select the breakout room that you would prefer, and we have um, uh, uh, people ready to assist each of the breakout rooms. So I'll stop the share, and Melanie, would you like to open up the um, breakout room screen? And I think we'll uh, try for um, maybe um, looks like around nine minutes for each of the breakout rooms. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming back. Um, so I hope uh, your, uh, your, your teams had um, uh, interesting discussions. Um, because of time, um, I think we'll only um, uh, have uh, one uh, uh, a representative for each of the four questions, uh, summarize what they found in um, their breakout rooms. And uh, while we do that, we did have a request from one um, breakout room participant um, for a link to the working paper itself. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat. So for the first question, the relevance of inland flooding um, as compared to a traditional focus on coastal flooding on climate preparedness policy and other lessons from Ida. Um, Courtney, may I ask you to take a minute to tell us what your uh, team discussed? Sure. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, some of the, the issues about, uh, you know, uh, flooding in terms of relative sea level rise um, versus sub subsidence of land and how sometimes there's a complexity of issues there in different places. And then, um, and the fact that, um, you know, the problems with FEMA flood maps um, being outdated um, and how it can be very hard for, for developers to make good decisions when they don't have good information. Um, we, I think that the conversation um, kind of shifted to, um, and also that, sorry, also just the homeowners have a hard time getting information. Sometimes there's, there's new sources of information like Redfin, um, uh, you know, that talk about specific properties, but it's really hard to know uh, what exactly it means. Um, and then we, this discussion kind of shifted to talking about inland flooding and how just really how so many of the places that we didn't associate with those kinds of risks are facing them now, especially with storms that kind of linger for a long time, cause a lot of rainfall. Um, so places that we didn't expect flooding, it's gonna be increasingly more routine and it's a real challenge. Uh, we talked about a little bit about areas of, um, uh, an example of Southern New Hampshire where there's just a lot more water that, that there's a lot of development increasing development uh, that, and so all the rainfall just kind of goes into the storm drain system and there's just more rainfall events. So it's, it's kind of both, both problems happening at once. Um, and so basically we, we kind of talked about how some of these inland areas have been thought about as climate havens, but it's not, you can't really take that for granted um, that just because you're not on the coast, you're not gonna have to deal with flooding and you're not, and you're going to be a climate haven. We need to kind of think about how um, maybe all development needs to be climate ready, um, you know, and how do we assess the cost and benefits 
of, of doing that, um, you know, especially in areas that currently are not booming, you know, but are thinking about becoming, you know, you know, places where climate migrants go. So anyway, it was a very fascinating discussion. I hope that wasn't too long, but I think the idea that, that all areas need to think about this as, a, as an issue is, is a really interesting one. Thank you, Courtney. These are some really, um, really interesting topics. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to move to the second uh, question. What are the key housing issues that should be mainstreamed into, into climate policy and vice versa? What are the advantages and challenges associated with these alternative approaches? Uh, Heather, uh, I think your group talked about that. Um, we did, and Jane took um, our, the notes for our group. Um, so, Jane, Jane, would you... Uh, Sure, Try to sure. summarize what we did. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, actually, I think um, a majority of our conversation was focused on energy efficiency regulations um, and whether it applies equally from affordable housing to market rate housing as, as well as other residential uh, neighborhoods. Um, I thought that it was really interesting. They We had discussions on like lead standards, which is applicable to more of the larger, uh, large scale, um, res uh, large scale uh, housing, but that we may not have the same regulatory standards for residential apartments and housing. And I think it was Emmy who mentioned that there are um, sort of uh, advances being made in residential labeling policies, which could actually help to promote um, some more um, energy efficiency as it relates to climate change. Other things that we mentioned was the language, whether or not we even have language for this, uh, which would be, I believe, an indication of whether we're making progress in this field with um, applying these regulatory standards. Um, as well as some um, considerations for like, um, you know, health issues and uh, how it relates to housing as well as to climate change. So Great. that was it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Jane. Mm -hmm. um, so the next, uh, the third topic was what experiences in developing climate ready housing in more affluent communities can be adapted to the needs and resources of lower income communities and communities of color. So I think here we had one breakout room and uh, Katsi and I were in the same room. Uh, Katsi, would you like to summarize or? Show? Yes, I can go. Um, so we discussed uh, one of the one strategy that it's called um, low, income, low impact development, um, which includes uh, simple strategies that involve nature itself to minimize impact of climate change, such as extreme rainfall and floodings. And so it involves uh, less expensive, um, it's a less expensive strategy, which will make it more accessible. And so this is more of an infrastructural lens of, of miti and mitigation. And so we talked about how we can use uh, low impact development in housing, um, in low income communities, uh, prevalently prevalently non-white communities, people of, where people of color live. And the other thing that we talked about was red of, about red of, retrofitting current developments instead of um, starting new ones. And so looking at how existing uh, federal programs allow or does not allow um, expand the, expanding projects, uh, existing projects, uh, to create climate ready housing. Yeah, that's yeah. what I got. Yeah, thanks. And I think I'd like to add that uh, it occurs to me that many of us may have experienced a federal housing, large scale federal uh, uh, public housing uh, redevelopment in the 1990s that uh, resulted in lots of displacement. And hopefully um, when we do more intensive um, retrofitting and rehabs, then we can learn from the lessons of previous public housing. So the last question was, uh, housing advocates and climate advocates may have access to different groups of policymakers and politicians. How could housing advocates and climate advocates perform their work together and whom should they target? And here we had uh, Sajani and Patricio assigned the two groups. Would either of you like to discuss the group that you were in? I can start. Well, it was a very small, intimate group of four people. But one participant noticed there was another uh, participant there. It's the elephant in the breaking room. And it was the perception of people, right, that climate is asso associated to whiter and wealthier um, constituency, while housing is associated to people of color, social justice advocates, and low income. So there's, you know, um, there are not many venues in which 
they they meet. But there was there has been and uh, remember the S10 bill that that uh, proposed an uh, increase in tax excess of the property transfer some uh, years ago, right? Where housing and climate advocates came together. Ideally, right, these venues may repeat. Um, someone also mentions, right, that for affordable housing advocates, the, the climate change issue is becoming unavoidable. So it's, uh, it's important, right, for them to have these, uh, these settings right, where they can get to know the work of, of, of others. Uh, we also asked uh, ourselves about what are experiences in other states, right, where housing advocates and climate advocates are getting together. And um, maybe if I am forgetting something, uh, someone from the group can help me. Okay, that's it. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much, Patricia. Um, in the few minutes uh, we have left, um, so I want to thank you so much for um, taking time to attend the presentation and participating in that breakout room discussions. Um, they, they've, been, they've been really rich. Um, I'd like to propose a few questions that can help us take what we've learned during the session and move our own research and practice agendas in new um, and interesting ways. You know, this is a very early stage in this research and um, I may not be alone in um, uh, looking for partners, uh, collaborators, um, community uh, co-creators, clients uh, who want to um, develop knowledge um, and generate solutions um, for the problems that we put out there. So one kind of question that we could, uh, we could leave with is what does housing and climate crisis mean for different cities, regions, and so we can learn from each other's experiences. My work is inspired by the place I live, Boston, Massachusetts, but it's certainly not limited to it. And I think it'll be fascinating to know how what we have talked about is refracted for our own um, experiences. Um, there are lots of potential um, promising next steps. These could include things like pilot studies, um, symposiums, class research. Um, there are lots of graduate student interns at UMass Boston who would um, look forward to the opportunity to work with your um, organizations or agencies or institutions. There's the possibility for policy roundtables um, and joint um, collaborations on proposals um, to various funding organizations. So um, at this point, I'd like to open it up to any ideas or reflections that any of you may have on how we can um, move this um, agenda forward. So for example, if any of you have been thinking about uh, an idea or a problem you've um, wanted to explore, but haven't had the space or the resources um, to do it, or even to know who to ask about it, um, this is the time and the place to do it. Um, if you think that there might be a dynamite funding proposal out there, um, but you're looking for someone to write it with, um, this would be a great place to share your ideas. So I'd like to leave you with this thought that, um, um, so this project has been an amazing learning experience for me about uh, the resources, um, the um, impact of the uh, Lincoln Institute uh, of Land Policy. Um, if you go to their working paper page, there must be over a hundred working papers. Um, so there are so many um, scholars and so many fields who are doing work um, in spaces related to ours. And um, I hope you'll have a chance, if you haven't yet, to uh, check out our working paper. And any of our co-authors are happy to follow up with any of you with uh, questions, um, ideas for um, uh, potential collaborations, for directions for research that even we hadn't thought of. At this point, um, it's at the hour. Um, and I'd like to ask, uh, Amy, if you have any um, parting thoughts before we go. Jess and I think that this has been an excellent conversation. I've enjoyed it and I've gotten a lot out of it and I hope it's not the last. Yeah, Amy, thanks so much. Um, so uh, I and uh, a number of the organizers uh, will be around. Um, we're happy to uh, continue the conversation. We'll also uh, sweep up and clean up. But in the meantime, thank you so much for taking your lunch hour um, to join us. I've enjoyed it very much. Let me give you a round of